Thank you, Michael. And I'd like to also thank the Marine Mammal Commission and NOAA Fisheries and the Smithsonian for organizing and hosting this symposium today on rice as whales and right whales. It's a real honor to be here today. Um, my presentation this morning is going to focus on how rice as whales were discovered to be the unique species that they are. And I'm going to start by giving just a little bit of background information on baleen whales of tropical and subtropical waters. And then we'll move to sort of to look at the timeline of all the research that took place to get us where we are today with this new species. And we'll make some stops along the way and look in more detail at certain events and research and results all culminating in our uh, final uh, formalizing of this new species. So rice's whales belong to the cetacean group called mysticetes or baleen whales. Uh, you saw a really nice picture of a baleen plate earlier this uh, morning in John's talk. And that group is evolutionarily distinct from all the other whales, dolphins, and porpoises in the world, all of which are odontocetes or toothed whales. There are currently 15 uh, recognized species of baleen whales around the world. And many of them do make uh, quite long annual migratory movements. Some uh, traveling great distances from high latitude feeding grounds in summer months like the Arctic and the subarctic or in the Antarctic, and then moving to more mid-latitude, uh, lower latitude waters in winter months for calving and breeding. Uh, however, there's one group of baleen whales that prefers to remain at middle latitudes year round in warmer subtropical, tropical, and somewhat uh, warm temperate waters. And this group includes the Brutus whale, Omura's whale, and Rice's whale. One key external feature of these warm water whales is they have uh, one or three ridges on the tops of their heads. And you can see in this photograph on the right, the arrows are trying to point to these long longitudinal ridges that go from the front of the blowhole to the, the, the front of uh, the head at the top of the rostrum. While this feature can be difficult to see, uh, especially at a distance, uh, it is a, a key characteristic that distinguishes uh, these whales from other uh, baleen whales. So the number of species in this group of warm water whales has changed through time as we've learned more about them. The first species was described in 1879 by John Anderson from a whale that was found, stranded and found in what is today Myanmar. He gave this whale the uh, scientific name Balenoptera edeni, and often the English common name is Eden's whale. And then in 1913, Olson described a new species from the coast of South Africa and it, uh, in uh, subtropical waters and gave this species the name Balenoptera bridei. And, and the common English name for that one is the Brutus whale. And in the last century or so, there's been some back and forth discussion or debate about whether these two actually represent two different species or whether they should be grouped back together into a single species with two subspecies. And that latter format, the single species, uh, which we now refer to as the Brutus whale, has two subspecies in it. And Brutus whales are found worldwide in tropical and subtropical waters. But in the late 1970s, uh, the very first evidence for a physically smaller group of Brutus whales was found in the Indo-Pacific. And in the following years, additional specimens were collected and examined for morphology and genetic data were collected until 2003 when Shirawada and his colleagues pulled that group of smaller Brutus whales out and elevated them and gave them their own species status and they named them Omora's whale. At that time, Omora's whale was thought to be restricted to the Western Pacific and sort of the Eastern Indian Indo-Pacific area. But with the new species description, people and researchers in other areas were able to re-examine whales uh, in their area. And we now know that Omora's whales are present in the Western Indian Ocean. They've been found in the East Atlantic near the equator along the coast of West Africa. And an Omora's whale was found stranded in the Southwestern um, Atlantic in Brazil. So after a similar pattern of gathering evidence over many years, rice's whales have now been pulled out of the Brutus whale species and again elevated to their own uh, species status. And the rest of the presentation today is going to focus on uh, all the steps and all the things that happened uh, to ultimately re give us this result. Um, I'd remiss, be remiss not to note, however, that the future taxonomy of what's left of the Brutus whales uh, species is 
very likely to change in the near future or in the future. I don't know when, but there's ongoing morphology uh, research and genetic research going on, and it's very possible that these two subspecies will be elevated back up to species status. And so at that point, we would have four warmer water baleen whales, the Eden's whale, Brutus whale, Omura's whale, and Rice's whale. So we'll see if and when that happens. So how did we get today, how did we get where we are today with Rice's whales? This slide gives some of the highlights of what's really kind of been a 30-year journey um, that's drawn on the skills of a lot of different people from a lot of different places. And I'm just sort of knitting all this history together to, for this presentation today. For us at the NOAA Fisheries, Southeast Fisheries Science Center, this trip really began in the early 1990s when we began our very first surveys for marine mammals in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, believe it or not, at that time, very little was known about the cetacean fauna in offshore waters in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, I think at that point in time, people would be really surprised to, to know what we know now, which is that the Gulf of Mexico is a highly diverse a habitat and ecosystem for cetaceans and marine mammals. There are 21 different species of whales and dolphins that make their home in the Gulf of Mexico. In 1991, in one of our very earliest ship-based efforts to look for marine mammals in the Gulf, we had for our first sightings of large baleen whales. These were seen in the upper uh, northeastern Gulf, and uh, the observers at the time noted that these animals had ridges on the top of their heads, and so they were identified as Brutus whales. Several more years of survey effort provided the evidence that, uh, that whales are actually present in the Gulf of Mexico year-round, so they have year-round residency. And in 2000, we, uh, uh, the fisheries uh, were able to collect the very first uh, biopsy sample from a free-ranging animal. And then the next 20 years, from 2000 to 2021, 20, uh, took us through a uh, lots more field efforts by lots of people, um, sample collection of, of biopsies, uh, sample collection from stranding through the Southeast U.S. Marine Mammal Stranding Network, um, uh, genetic samples that, uh, samples that could be used for genetic analysis and morphological analysis, all of that gathering lines of evidence that culminated in the new species description in 2021. So that first baleen whale sighting in 1991 has uh, been followed by uh, field efforts over the decades since then, and that's helped identify the whale's distribution in the Gulf. And there is this uh, f a focal area of distribution in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico, which you can see in the, the yellow polygon area. But in more recent times, we're learning now about their use of the waters in the Western Gulf of Mexico as well. And you'll hear more about that work this afternoon from Dr. Melissa Soldvia. Based on all this field effort, we also know that the population size is very small with fewer than 100 individuals with the current best estimate of the population in the Northern Gulf of Mexico being 51 whales. So when we are out at sea during the surveys, uh, the field uh, folks try to obtain, when the conditions are appropriate, skin biopsy samples from the whales. And as I mentioned, when whales are found stranded on the shoreline, the stranding network members will respond to those strandings and collect a wealth of information, including samples for analyses. And all these uh, various sources of skin can be used for a genetic analysis of the whales. But because these whales are so rare and uh, it's really difficult to get samples, it uh, took a long time for us to accumulate enough samples to have any kind of rigorous sample set for a genetic analysis, for example. And the graph at the bottom of the page um, kind of lays that out, showing the numbers of samples that were able to be collected over the years, uh, per year over the years, starting in that year 2000. So with, uh, with that in the mid, Mid-2000s, we did start looking at the genetics of these animals um, with the few samples that we had. And by 2008, we sort of had enough to do at least some preliminary work. And that work uh, showed that these, the genetic signature of these whales was really quite different from anything else that was out there at the time. And these results then led to the questions of whether they are genetically different enough to be considered a different species and what else would we need? What other information would we need to collect and research would we need to do to actually make that determination? 
So traditionally, morphological data have been used to identify new cetacean species, uh, going back, as you saw in John's uh, presentation, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. In particular, for cetaceans, it's features of the skull that have been most important, including things like skull shape, sometimes the size, but also the orientation, size, and shape of certain bones that make up the skull as a whole. More recently, genetic data have been applied to new species descriptions for cetaceans, and in particular, evidence for diagnostic DNA sequence differences and uh, certain levels of genetic divergence between putative groups um, are metrics that are being used. And then in 2017, Dr. Barbara Taylor and her colleagues created guidelines and standards for identifying cetacean uh, species and subspecies using genetic information. And they provided um, a minimum level of genetic divergence and other metrics that should be met when identifying a new species or subspecies. And importantly, they stress that at least two uh, independent lines of evidence for species distinction really should be provided when describing a new species. Um, I'd like to point out that the cetacean species tree has been growing even in the last 20 years with seven new species recognized. And so identifying a new species of cetacean isn't um, totally unheard of in our day and age, but finding a new large whale was, was unusual. In fact, recent work has suggested that there may be as many as 40 unrecognized subspecies of cetaceans out there in the world. So there really is still a lot more work to be done on cetacean taxonomy. So returning to our sampling efforts, um, by 2011, uh, where you see the, the gray dotted line on, on that graph, we had accumulated 25 tissue samples and conducted the first comprehensive genetic analysis of these whales. We compared DNA sequences from the whales in the Gulf of Mexico, the samples that we had, to sequences available from all other large whale species around the world to see where those Gulf animals fall on an evolutionary tree of relationships among baleen whale species. Would they be on their own branch or would they just be mixed in with a currently recognized Brutus whale species, for example? And that tree, resulting tree, is shown here. We found that the whales in the Gulf are, in fact, um, they're shown in the, the darker red box here. They are, in fact, on their own uh, lineage, their own evolutionary branch of that tree, separated from the branches that lead to all the other baleen whales, including the rices, uh, sorry, the Brutus whale subspecies, Anamore as well. We also compared the sequences from the rices whales in the Gulf to samples collected in other parts of the Atlantic Ocean. And so on this map, you see uh, reports of Brutus whales identified either from morphology, just so you can get a sense of uh, where other Brutus whales have been identified in the Gulf of Mexico, oh, sorry, in the Atlantic, and those are the blue dots. And then uh, Brutus whales identified using DNA sequence information, those are the brown dots. And we found no samples in the Atlantic with the DNA signature of a rice's whale in any of the whales that were sequenced and, provide, and were available at this time. We also expanded that comparison to DNA sequence data available from Brutus whales throughout the, the globe. And again, we found no matches between the uh, rice's whale uh, DNA uh, information, the genetic information that we collected from the Gulf to anywhere else in the, in the world. In addition, we did find the, the diagnostic uh, differences in the DNA sequence that I mentioned as a, an important metric uh, in the genes that we looked at. And in fact, you can look at some of these sequences uh, straight out and just say, oh yeah, that definitely came from a rice's whale. They're, they're that distinctive. Almost a few of those sites in the DNA sequence are shown in the lower panel, oops, uh, um, surrounded by the, the um, green rectangles, those show unique positions that say this is a rice's whale. We also found that the number of differences in the DNA uh, between the whales in the Gulf and the other species uh, exceeds that between other already recognized species of whales. So for example, uh, the, there were more differences between the Gulf animals and Brutus whales than there are between existing right whale species. And the genetic divergence exceeded that level recommended by Taylor et al. for species level status. 
And finally, we found that the animals had very low genetic diversity in the genes we looked at, and that's indicative of a small population size, which goes with the, uh, matches well with the field information uh, where we have an, a field-based abundance estimate of less than 100 animals. So we have now this evidence for a unique genetic signature and the level of genetic divergence from these other whales. Uh, that gave really the first clue that the animals in the Gulf of Mexico are significantly different from Brutus whales elsewhere in the world and, and may represent a new species. And so our next step then was to investigate whether they meet species level uh, thresholds or, or metrics uh, in their morphology and thus began the search for a skull that could be used to examine their morphology and make comparisons to the skulls of other closely related baleen whales. And this skull, as you've heard already, would, we would want it to be able to serve as the holotype specimen for the species. And the holotype you can think of as like it's the standard bearer for the morphology of a species. And um, if there's ever a question about, in the future, about what is the morphology of a rice's whale, you would go to that holotype specimen. So you want it to be intact, preferably from a, an adult animal, so it has you know, final characteristics, and you want it to be well-preserved and, and safe and protected in a, in a museum like the Smithsonian here. So we combed through a lot of old historical stranding records from the Gulf of Mexico, and found two animals that stranded in the Gulf that might fit this bill. The first was a skull from an animal that stranded in Louisiana in 1954, and for which the skull had been deposited at the Louisiana uh, State University Museum of Natural Science in Baton Rouge. And the museum kindly allowed us to come look at the skull and, and perform a DNA test on it, so we collected a, a small amount of powder, of bone powder from it, and took it back to the lab and looked at its genetics and were able to confirm that it was in fact a rice's whale. But unfortunately, many of the most important bones in the skull in that specimen were missing. And so it wouldn't allow us to do these morphological comparisons um, for necessary for looking at baleen whale, baleen whale species. So the second possibility was a whale that stranded in 2009 in Tampa Bay, Florida. This was an adult female that had been killed by a ship strike. And um, the, um, we knew at, at the time we were doing this that the whale was a rice's whale uh, because it, we had already done a genetic analysis of a sample from it when it stranded in 2009. Um, and you can see in the Google image on the upper right picture, it shows where the animal, or you, it shows the sand scar here from where the animal was buried after it had been pulled up on the beach. And this is in 2010, so several months after it had been buried. So what we wanted to figure out is whether or not the skull of this animal was still intact and could it serve our need of a holotype specimen so that, and, and an ability, giving us ability to do these morphological analyses. And importantly though, uh, the location by the time we were looking for this in 2017 had completely revegetated. So were we even gonna be able to find the skull? So in January of 2018, a team of more than uh, 30 volunteers from at least uh, 12 organizations and agencies got together to try and excavate the whale. And after some initial false starts, we did actually locate the skeleton. Um, but unfortunately, it was really close to the water line at the time. And um, we found as we excavated it that it was actually uh, basically buried in water you can see this skull here surrounded by water as we dug out all the sand. And that was not conducive, as you can imagine, to preserving those bones. We found, in fact, that the skull had been crushed and broken into a number of pieces, possibly from the time when it was buried. It was the last thing put on the top of the carcass, so it was pretty near the surface, and it may have been crushed as the, as the sand was put back in and the bulldozer kind of finished over the, the, the area. Um, we did get a nearly complete vertebral column, and you see that here on the, the right-hand side of the slide, um, but the skull could not serve, as, uh, serve our morphological needs, and uh, we couldn't use it to move forward with any formal taxonomic comparisons at that time. But all the bones that we found, uh, we found uh, quite a lot of the animal there. Um, they've all been preserved, and they're all archived in the Florida Museum of Natural History.
So then in January of 2019, a whale stranded near Flamingo, Florida, down here at the bottom of uh, Florida, um, in, the western, in the eastern Gulf of Mexico at the outer edge of Everglades National Park. And based on the unique shape of the back of the dorsal fin, which you see in this photo here, this is the dorsal fin and it's being held up against someone's hand. This um, trace here on the back was unique enough that it was recognized as a whale that had been seen earlier on earlier cruises further north in the Gulf of Mexico. We received a small piece of tissue from the animal and um, confirmed further that it was a rice as well. And so then began this amazing uh, work of researchers and volunteers from all over the Gulf states as well as up the eastern seaboard to carefully preserve this precious specimen. And um, you'll hear more about these remarkable efforts in the following presentations. I'm just going to uh, skip to the final answer, which is that those efforts were so super successful, and the entire skeleton of the animal has been uh, uh, preserved and is here at the Smithsonian, including the skull with all its little bones and pieces were all intact. So with that available, the morphology of these whales could now be examined and see to see how it compares to the other baleen whales. And we did, in fact, find diagnostic differences in multiple bones in the skull uh, that distinguish it from the other whales. And in particular, when you look at the skull from above, which is what this uh, photograph is on the far left, you're looking down at the top of the skull. If you focus in on the area at the top here, which, uh, where a lot of bones are together to form the blowhole of the animal, um, there are differences in the shapes and the lengths and some of the orientations of several of the bones in this area that clearly distinguish Rice's whales. And these are all features of bones that were also used to previ previously establish Omora's whale as a separate species as well. So this provided that second independent line of evidence that I mentioned for the unique evolutionary heritage of the Rice's whale. So with this morphological comparison, we now have this consistent story, this consistent support for species level differences for these whales from the Gulf. And the combined weight of this large genetic differences, divergence, as well as these diagnostic morphological characters all supported the conclusion that the whales uh, from the Gulf of Mexico are a different species. And with the holotype specimen now um, preserved, uh, here at the Smithsonian, we had all the pieces necessary to do this formal species description, and that work was what came out in, was published in 2021. Since that new uh, species description was published, additional lines of evidence have further corroborated the uniqueness of these whales. And as you will hear in other presentations this afternoon, um, they have unique calls and sounds, and that's um, use of these acoustic characteristics are helping us better define their uh, distribution in the Gulf of Mexico and their movements. Um, additional genomic data are being examined, and you'll hear about that this afternoon as well, uh, to further evaluate the evolutionary relationships between Rice's whales and between all the baleen whale species. And we've been, um, more recently, there have been efforts to uh, get a better understanding of the habitat preferences of these animals. Um, you'll hear about that as well. Um, and we know that um, they seem to prefer relatively shallower waters when compared to most other Brutus whale populations around the world, again, giving them another difference in their, their habitat and their lifestyles. And you'll hear also more about uh, use of the baleen for understanding things like hormones and looking at stable isotopes. So there's lots of work. But all of this additional evidence has uh, bolstered the certainty in the uniqueness of these whales as, uh, and their designation as a separate species. So in summary, Rice's whales are a unique evolutionary branch in the baleen whale tree. We have morphological data, acoustic data, and the genomic genetic data all in support of this. They are the only resident baleen whale in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and they utilize a quite thin band of habitat in the northern Gulf and possibly also in the southern Gulf. 
They have a very small population size, uh, which leaves them critically endangered and in need of protections and conservation. Incredible progress has been made in the past five years um, in our understanding um, in, about the, some of the basic biology of these animals, but there's still lots to be learned. And uh, for example, we, there's we're lots of still missing information on demog some of the demography and more about their ecology and their feeding um, preferences uh, in the Gulf and uh, how, they're util how individual animals utilize the Gulf from east to west. So there's a lot more work to be done to gain a full understanding of these rare and unique whales in the Gulf of Mexico so that we can be sure to um, protect and conserve them. So um, I want to acknowledge uh, groups of people. As I mentioned, there are a lot of people who have been collecting data of some form or another on whales in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, strandings uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and up the East Coast. So it's really hard to, to, to basically name everybody. Um, but I'd really like to acknowledge the, the crews and the science teams of all the vessels and ships that have, help, have been conducting all the field work to collect information on sightings and distribution, being able to estimate abundance of these animals, collecting samples for the genomics and genetics, as well as other analyses. Um, and other samples so we uh, can look at prey preferences and movements and tagging. Uh, it's a lot of effort. I'd also like to thank the Southeast U.S. Marine Mammal Stranding Network members uh, from Texas to Florida and all up the East Coast who have all responded to large whale strandings. Well, they all, they all respond to all whale strandings but, uh, and dolphins, and, uh, but in this situation uh, with respect to all the information they've collected on uh, the uh, Rice's Whale strandings in the Gulf and on the East Coast. And finally, again, the volunteers and the agencies that were involved in 2018 and 2019 and 2020 to secure this important holotype specimen that we have now of this whale. Thank you. Thank you.